Hey everyone, it's the first ever live episode of Annex School. <laughs> and uh, we've got a great show for you today with Phil Reddington. Hi. Um, just before COVID hit, we had this fantastic course planned for Phil at Josh Polanski's lab in, near Philadelphia. That all got canceled. So we thought, what can we do to get Phil's knowledge out there um, to the people who need it? So we bring you Annex School, very first episode. Before we start, please, if you plan on asking Phil a question, or even if you don't, you don't know, you might want to. So go to StreamYard.com slash Facebook and give StreamYard, the app we're using to broadcast this stream, give them permission to see your name so that we can see your name when we add your comments. Now, Casey White, you can't see her, but she's here. Uh, in the background watching your comments as the live stream goes on. And as soon as I've had a chance to ask Phil some really frequent questions that customers have already posed, we will open it up for your questions and we won't see them before they pop up when Casey puts them on the screen. So this should be interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so with no further ado, welcome to Hey, hey, Phil. Hey, Ter, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Thank you for being like a little bit of our guinea pig on this, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, well, I'm um, guinea pig, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it tapped. <laughs> yeah. So one of the reasons I picked Phil, not only was it because he had a course for, with us that got canceled at the last minute, but um, I have always spent a lot of time laughing with Phil. And our whole point of this is that web education is kind of the only option we have right now. It doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to, it can be fun. So I picked Phil because Phil's fun. I like Phil. <laughs> I'll try not to disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are gonna talk to you about Pecton hybrids. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Phil, uh, Phil is a dental technician out of Leeds, UK. And I met Phil back in 2015, I guess, right? Maybe 2014 online, 2015 in person. Yeah. And um, Pecton brought us together, right? Yeah, sure. So Von Gro and the DTG group brought you and Lee Mullins over to do a course at in Utah. And that's where we met. Yeah. Phil has been a front runner from day one with high performance polymers in um, hybrid restorations. So he's seen the good, he's seen the bad, he's seen the ugly. And that's what we're gonna talk about. And I'm a big fan of talking about the ugly so that other people can learn from our mistakes, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, for sure. So the first question I wanna ask you is a really short question with probably a pretty long answer, but um, what is an ideal pecton hybrid case? Okay, so an ideal one is uh, one where we've got plenty of vertical space, uh, where and where we've got mm, uh, end plants positioned optimally, really. We want to be avoiding distal cantilevers that are beyond maybe one tooth, in my opinion, uh, when we're just using a pure pecton frame. So I look for my ideal solution is like an all on six, where you've got a good spread of implants and decent amount of vertical height, somewhere between six and 10 mil between the bottom of the tooth and where the frame needs to finish you should give you enough height in most positions obviously if you have in, uh, implants that place too palatal and then your frame needs to be out there you can end up with other complications which might make you want to rethink material choice but generally speaking with good planning if the implants are in the right place then most cases are suitable for pecton when we're talking about full arches it's only once we get below that vertical space that I would then maybe look at titanium. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second because, and I know we're gonna talk a little bit more in detail about questions I think probably people are gonna have related yeah, to sure. this question, larger question. But one of the things that I've noticed is in the States anyway, these thimble bridges, they really were pretty new um, back in 2015 when Pecton was around. I think a lot of people were pressing back then because the CAD software hadn't really caught up with what we were wanting to do to even design a split, split file frame. 
Um, so when you started doing pecton, you already had experience with these individual crowns on a thimble frame, correct? Absolutely. We've been doing them at the lab on metal uh, originally on, uh, believe it or not, in, as far back as 2008, we were working with a company in the UK that was printing metal back then, that far back. And that's when we first started uh, looking at it. Um, and then we, we just, we were casting a lot of stuff then as well, but that's when we were first doing the thimble type designs, individual preps. They were known as whirly bridges. It was nothing sort of uh, new. It'd been around for a long time. Uh, and it was just us getting to the point where we finally had places in that were suitable. So we had been using them for 10 years before we switched the packs on. And we'd okay. been doing it for like eight, eight years before we switched to high performance polymers, uh, you know, before packs on was around. So, we had a lot of experience with these bridges, yeah. Okay, so when now that when you added the options, you already had the option for titanium before. Mm -hmm. I know this may surprise you, but a lot of labs here in the States, when they've gotten into full arch, they don't have experience with either the titanium or the pecton. So I find that jumping right into pecton is a big jump. Um, and maybe a smaller leap is getting into the titanium frames instead first and then going to pecton. But having both of those as options, my next question is when do you pick titanium? Okay. And when do you pick, why, why what about a case would have you go into titanium instead of pecton? I could show you a picture of a case that would go, would go straight to titanium okay. now if you want to try to do a screen share. Yeah. Uh, let me just where this is. Um, because I know, I mean, I know you and I have talked at length about distal extensions. I know asking this question, I already know that's that's one reason that titanium may be a better option over pecton. Mm -hmm. The length of the distal extension and also the span between implants. So are you seeing this now? Yeah. Okay, so let me see, let me switch to a, uh, so this this one would be a, a, an ideal case for pecton, uh, sorry, this one here. So we, you've got enough um, space and you can see just roughly where the implants are placed, there's two in the centrals, two at the threes, and then two all the way back at the sixes. So that's a really good spread there uh, for a pecton case. And you can see the sort of bar design, that's absolutely optimal. Um, for making a, a bridge, you know, like a thimble design bridge. Now, what I would like to show you is when, so this uh, is, is basically what I'm looking at when I'm looking at the heights. The green is good, is go, because we've got the gap spaces between seven to nine, 10 millimeters below the bottom of the teeth. And the other side of this arch, the same arch, you can see how low we're getting. So one side of the bridge would be titanium, the other side would be packed on no problem. So you can see how even just one or two teeth positions can then make me switch to titanium because we might have a possible uh, weak area on the bar unless there was an implant position under that. So there's a few things that you take into consideration. And this is one that uh, definitely would be um, titanium. Sorry, one second, it's hard to skip through because I can't see that. So here we go. So this is a titanium option. And the pure reason is this area in between the two centrals, and you see how thin that bar is there. So we've got, for me, we're way below what we'd need to be for, for me to be comfortable with pecton. We might get some flex on that point and then we'd get some fracture. We'd definitely get some possible delamination of, um, of the composite if that was to move at all that area. So that's why uh, that's the sort of case when I would say that's definitely titanium. So it's that that vertical from the, the bottom of the frame to the, to where the, the frame is, is going to finish. Well, and you mentioned something that's, I think, really important for people to understand. So the, um, the, the worry of breakage isn't the only worry, right? The worry of breakage isn't the only worry. No, no, no. Flexure can happen without breakage, which is one of the, you know, the slight flex in the give it has is a good thing. But if flexure happens and it's veneered with a, you know, rigid composite, then you can have cracks or delaminations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that actually leads me 
perfectly to my next question for you. And I want you to answer this absolutely honestly from your own experience. Yeah. And then I know you're kind of the go-to for people to Facebook message or call whenever yeah. something goes wrong for them. So yeah. I want to talk I'd at great to. length about when Pecton goes wrong, because I know when it goes well, when it's planned well and everything goes well, I hear not just like rave reviews from the dentist, the patient, the lab, everybody's super happy. But when it goes wrong, it goes wrong. So can yeah. you tell us a little bit about your experience as you've been learning? Absolutely. And the thing that goes wrong is usually nothing to do with the material. It's usually to do with our understanding. And it's, I would without doubt say that all the failures that I've had have been because of my either design flaws or expecting too much of the material. So even though I have other problems and I have narrowed down my criteria for what's suitable for Pecton, six years ago, I was basically putting 90% of the arches as Pecton. Now I'm down to probably near a 60%. Mm -hmm. it's, not that the it's not that I've lost faith in the material, it's that I understand the material better now. And the failures that I've had have been, for instance, when you have two um, uh, implants so close together that there's no space for the, the material in between them. Now, if this is milled titanium or milled chrome cobalt, there's no cylinders in there, there's nothing. It's just one solid lung. So this, having two implants really close together with two cylinders can create a massive weak spot, especially if then you've got like a distal cantilever after that weak spot. And I can even bring, quickly bring you up a, an image of, of exactly that happened, how it happened on one of my cases. Right now, one second, let me share this with you again, sir. I should have the right picture up this time, though. <laughs> Here we go, where are we? Yeah. Sorry, no, let's try again. There it is. Okay, so we'll, we'll go again now. Uh, sorry. <laughs> You've got to, it's weird because you have to have the, the thing on screen to be able to say share it, but it was hidden behind the, the screen. So. I thought I was going to be the one having yeah. so, Phil. So now I can show you this. So this is exactly what I was talking about. So you've got no material thickness on the on the pecton there, either side of that cylinder, mm -hmm. and there was another implant after it, and then a distal cantilever. And that just, I mean, this was in for about three years, so it did way better than I would have expected. But this is just purely down to bad design on our, our part, which this, this should have never have uh, been a, a polymer case. Not yeah. just polymer, you know, not just pecton, a polymer case full stop. And this was, um, for, I think, more than 2015, and we had to redo it in 2018. So we got a few years out of it. And I actually bring this case with me everywhere I go now and show people this, this case in the flesh as well. Um, at the time, we were still pressing everything, and we got around these sort of issues by pressing over things like this. But now, I don't press any, any pecs on at all. I just mill purely, so I would now just switch to um, titanium. And this is another reason why my pecton cases have gone down, because I don't, I, I don't press anymore. So if I did press, I would still be doing more pecton cases and pressing over metal, but just mm -hmm. from the, the way that I'm working now, which is purely digital, and I just don't have the time uh, uh, to, to sit there and, and do these uh, these older procedures now. So that's purely, from my perspective, one of the reasons why I'm doing less. But that's a major failure point. Even if you're milling and you've got two wind plants too first close together, those cylinders take up a lot of space, a lot of frame space. It's going to cause a disaster. In so my opinion. How much thickness around each cylinder do you shoot, what's your minimum when you're doing a pecton frame? Uh, again, I can show you the, 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 the frames really quickly um, from above. Uh, because I've had some people say a millimeter, some people say I, two. Uh, I'd, I would say a millimeter is getting on the, sh on the small side. Um, I'd say millimeter to two millimeters and you're gonna be fine. And again, it depends on the rest of the of the bridge if you've got uh, one at the back uh, that's only got a millimeter around it and then you've got like two pontic spaces between it that's going to get a lot more pressure on that too if you've got um one that's in a cluster of implants to so see you've got like one two two in the lateral spaces two in the you know in between the threes and fours two at the back then if one of those is, is coming close to the edge of the pecs and that's not going to be a problem it's yeah. when you have you, you have to work out 
um, when to isolate the problem because you can't just apply one rule. Like you can't always say, right, three mils is always going to be okay. Because in some situations, even three mils may not be okay. It's there's so many different systems out there, and there's so many different ways that people place implants. There's so many different mouths and the way that people function um, that you have to take each case by a case basis, and that really comes from experience. So. Again, what I would say is everyone who's ever been on one of my courses, they're, all, they're, they're always open. I, I'm always happy to let them send me designs for me to look at and tell them yes or no. And I'll point out which has said yes and which has said no. And that's a, a service I'm happy that I, that I do all the time. And I'm happy for anyone to, to hit me up on Messenger and send me a picture. If they're thinking of going pets on and they're really not sure, then I'm happy to be 100% truthful with them because it is a learning experience. And, and uh, you know, it, 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 you can't just say one rule and then apply it across the board. That's what I've learned from working with polymers is each case is the demands that you apply these rules, but then look at the other parameters around it to see whether there's some leniency on a couple of those rules. And yeah, so I, 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 in all fairness, in over 300 arches, I've only had three three arch failures? Well, and that's the thing. So I have gotten emails with pictures of broken pecton frames for sure, but never has one, never has one made me scratch my head really. Maybe yeah. at first look, but once I see the STL file or something, once I see all the information, it's really clear. Like it's either too far, the implants were too far apart, right? Because yeah. it's a two pontic, you know, limitation, no more yeah. than that. Yeah. And then I've seen like 20 millimeter cantilevers, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and only one broke. I was like, man, like the fact that only one broke is kind of a miracle. <laughs> They've been reading just on that side, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's usually how it goes, you know. But um, I think that you having the ability to lean on titanium and approach everything super conservatively is yeah. really important. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, li limited vertical. So the two questions I get all the time is how much of a distal extension can I do? And um, how much is my minimum vertical? Okay, so my minimum vertical, I would say at absolute minimum that I've done, and this has been with optimal implant placement, is six millimetres below the, the cutting margin of the tooth. So six millimetres of, of, of pecton. Now, I'm mo most of the cases that I do in pecton are between seven and ten millimetres of space. So, you know, way below what I'd call minimum. Uh, and as long as you've got that in vertical, then usually you, you're going to be pretty good. When it comes to distal uh, cantilevers, I don't like going over one tooth. One tooth, I, I just try to bring everything to a short and dental arch if possible. If the implants are not far enough back, if they're angled implants don't go far enough back, I just put one tooth back there. And ideally, I'd like that to be half a tooth because why would you not? You know, <laughs> well, if you want everything to be optimally placed, so you're not having big distal cantilevers. But I'm happy to go one tooth, for sure, with enough space. And again, if I just go back to that one, um, one picture. Oh, sorry, um, where's it gone? Where's my? Yeah. Go back to one picture. Well, while you're pulling that up, so we've even had some people, what's interesting about Pecton, I think we had, Casey and I had somebody just about a week ago that had posted a case before delivery and the distal extension was really pushing it. It was like one and a half molars. So yeah. um, I said, okay, here's the deal. The molar, the, the last molar is unnecessary, right? Mm -hmm. So at this point you could still remove yeah. it. Yeah, absolutely. And remove the, that tooth and polish off the end of the... Exactly, which you couldn't do, you know. So we did contact that technician and say, hey, listen, just understand, you can deliver it like this. That's fine. Know what, know what. And they, they knew that they were pushing it. But yeah. if it breaks, it's not going to break on that molar. It's going to break around the cylinder. And then it's not something that you can fix. Okay. So this, I don't know if you can see this screen now, if that's come up. Yes. 
So, so, so if you look at the green one, on that the one, the one that the, the molar at the back that's got nine millimeters of space beneath it, I would be happy to have that molar on a, a, this a cantilever on with that nine millimeters of thickness of, of polymer frame on frame the other side at six even though i said six is the minimum that i'd go for i wouldn't want a distal cantilever on a six millimeter space does that make sense yeah so i, I can say six millimeters is the minimum that i'd go between, below the bottom of the tooth to in order to fit my frame in but then if you're going to add a distal cantilever that all of a sudden jumps up to nine millimeters or ten millimeters so it's not just a one size fits all um answer you know you have to think about this thing if that's not um, a distal cantilever on that red one, then how might be with the six underneath that a framework if there's a, an implant situated underneath it? I'm, I'm, I've not got a problem with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So one thing that, and I'm, I'm betting we're going to have some specific questions in the comments later, so we can um, we can move on from that. Yeah. But um, polishing of pecton and really also this. I want to kind of make this combo question. Let's talk about your pecton polishing protocol, because I think a lot of people, there's so many different resins and polymers that are being marketed for this. Um, some can be exposed to the tissue, some can't. Mm -hmm. In pecton's case, it's completely implantable, so you don't have to seal it. You know, I think a lot of people get confused about that. But um, it's important that it's polished, right? When it comes off the mill, it's already pretty smooth. But what is your protocol for the intaglio surface in general? What's your design protocol? I, I used to try lots of different things uh, and that was when we were pressing because that stuff's really hard to polish when you press it, I think. It, there's, it, it, it changes color, there's lots of different things that happen to it. But when we're talking about mill, I just use my denture lathe. I go straight to the lathe, I use standard sort of fine pumice and then I use uh, this amazing stuff. Um, I think it was, uh, Robert Arvai that told me about this first time, Acromarvel polish, it's yeah. an acrylic polish. I just use that and the standard, you know, fine mop that you use for polishing a denture and it brings it, you know, up so, so smooth that uh, it's perfect. You don't need to get over complicated with it. I used to use all kinds of combinations, these little brushes that have got like little bits of leather and bits of all sorts of stuff inside them and different mops and different compounds. And and now it's just pumice and a, a, and a lathe, yeah, on the denture lathe. And you know what? I'm doing that with the, the, the composite as well uh, later on. So even if I, I polish the pecs on first before mm -hmm. everywhere it's going to be, it wants to be polished. But, you know, when you're working with composite, you get some stuff, sticky stuff somewhere you shouldn't, and I have to polish that off again. And it's easy to do with a lathe because, again, I'm just going to polish the, the, the composite as well in parts with a lathe. So it just works okay. with the same stuff. It's easy, simple. That is a lot easier than I have understood. That's I like that answer a lot better. <laughs> yeah, to add, you know, obviously, if you've got, if you've had to do some grinding on it, whether a sprues have been attached, things like that, there is these uh, little um, sandpaper cones called Meister cones that you can use that polish it down really smoothly. And again, just like a Kenda polisher, you know, for yeah, for in, uh, acrylic, those things all work fine for taking any rough cut marks or burr marks or anything that the, if the, 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 the mill's made a mark that you don't want to be there, you can grind those out easily with just standard um, uh, denture polishing stones and rubbers and then go straight to the lathe. It's, it's, it's not that hard to do. Okay. So in addition to polishing the pecton, I think one of the things that I hear most from technicians who really want to do a pecton case, but they can't get a doctor on board to prescribe one, mm -hmm. the weak link is always, oh, well, the doctor is concerned about how the composite's going to hold up over time. They'd rather do zirconia. They'd rather do ceramic. They're just concerned about how that composite's going to look over yeah. time. And I understand all the history of that issue in mouths, mm -hmm. but we do have some different products and different, um, I don't know, not, not, not a lot of the science has changed, but maybe what we know about it has changed. Yeah. So what do you do and how has your composite polishing and sealing um, process changed over what you've learned over time? Uh, okay, well, th the biggest thing that I've changed is no, it, it, that has changed is that it's again it massively depends on the patient. I was literally just before we come online chat, talking with Chad Perry in Texas, mm -hmm. Dr. Perry, about this exact thing, and he's just doing a, a case with Joshua at the moment and uh, wanted to say, Well, 
what, what, what's your theories on how long the composite's going to be before you need to sort of do anything with it? And I, and it, it basically can be anywhere. And this is in, I'm not trying to, uh, to, to, to make any, anything up. I'm being brutally honest. We've had stuff that's come back after five years that's looked amazing. And we've had stuff that's come back after six months that looks like it's been literally in a sewer for six months, you know? And, it, 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 and, and these are the same protocols that have been applied to it. And now, generally speaking, depending on which dentist, they either want a polished finish or they want a glazed finish if they want more of a natural sort of look. And again, the, the, I think the glazed lack, lack of finishes tend to um, be a little bit more... Um, you know, it's more natural. There's more areas for stuff to stick to and get into. So they tend to funk up a little bit quicker than a smooth polished surface, obviously. Really? But okay. even the most polished, highly polished acrylic in a patient, the wrong patient's mouth will, you know, if they're smoking and they're, you know, never cleaning properly, the hygiene's bad, or the, even if the design and the frame's bad, it's going to get stuff stuck to it. And the, way, the thing that I, that's changed massively for me now is before I used to do whatever I thought was absolutely best and then hope that it still looked good in five years. <laughs> and it wouldn't. And now what I say is, look, we're going to send you this out and it's going to be pristine when it comes out. But depending on your patient's hygiene, we might need to get this thing back in for a, 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 what we call a service. And this came from a technician that I learned a lot from years ago called John Wibberley. And he always said when he did his hybrid, and he's been doing these for 30 years now, he always said, it's like a car. You, ch you don't keep the same tires on your car. You change your car tires every year. You take your car in for a service. You change the oil. And that's what I say to the, the dentist now is you, you're going to have a, a bridge that's already been made from the conversion day. If that's no good anymore, we can make you a copy in multi, you know, multi-layered mill PMMA. And in a year, two years, four years, five years, whenever this composite needs... A refresh we you can unscrew the one bridge put the, the courtesy car bridge in yeah back and within 24 hours we'll we'll give it a, a you know reupholster or whatever and most of the time that means a touch of uh, maybe some sandblasting in some areas on the bottom uh, around the fixtures where stuff's stuck a little bit and have not cleaned but generally it's just again pumice and polish okay. on the board and it's done you know so you're yeah. not having to, when you see a case back in like that and you do have to touch it up, even if it looks terrible on the surface, you're not finding that that staining and that surface, that bad looking surface is any deeper than just polishing off. No, no. Okay. Like I say, occasionally there's some really hard calculus stuck to a few places that I might have to grind off, but that's yeah. calculus, not in the, it's not real. I don't say, I would definitely say it's not inside the composite. It's all on surface. Okay. Uh, I had one bridge that had been in since 2014 and just before lockdown. And um, I was just telling Chad, it was a crack on one of the teeth. It had just come in for a, a little bit of a, a refurb. And I, t I took the, the tooth off. And when I was take, grinding the tooth off, you have to prep these teeth off. I was I, I, I cut into the uh, composite and chipped a bit of the composite away. And even just being, you know, putting a new tooth on, sealing the composite up and then just repolishing it all again. It looked like a brand new bridge again. And if that thing after seven years had real, any real problems, I would have had to grind all of that composite out. And I only had to grind out around where I'd, I'd, I'd replaced the tooth that had a little crack in it. Yeah, okay. So do you polish, do you take it to a polish and then glaze? Like what is your protocol now? Polish everything on the palette or lingual. Always polish it on the anti on the front part. You know, on the, on the facial part. Generally, then glaze that depending on what the aesthetic of the, the dentist wants. Some of the dentists just want it smooth and polished. Some of them, and most of them, do want them to look quite nice. And then I will glaze those. Yeah, that will use the Opti Glaze Kit. So I know that um, over time. Of course, acrylic hybrids, we know what they look like underneath after a while when they're screwed down. They got stuff growing on them. The tissue's irritated. So I know with Pecton, the whole point is not to veneer the intaglio because the polished Pecton surface is not going to accumulate bacteria and stain and odor the way that composite, even well-sealed, well-polished composite would. Have you seen that to be the case with your Pecton cases? Um, again, I think 
a massive amount of that is down to design. Again, if you've got the ridge lap, no matter what you've got on, on that surface, it's gonna it's gonna have some stuff growing on it. Um, in terms of Again, I would. I'm being not completely honest here. Today. I've had stuff that has been pure pecton polished on, on the underneath and good design on patients with bad hygiene, smoking like chimneys, and it's been black. And then I've had stuff been like the day it's gone out after longer time. It, 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 there's so many factors come into it. If the patient's got good hygiene, I would always prefer to keep the palatal and the intaglio in pecton. And if if the patient's not got good hygiene, then it doesn't matter what you put under there. It really, it does. It, it goes out. It's, it's always going to come back with stuff growing on it. But I would definitely say that um, you can see where you know, the, you know, on, on, even when it's really funky, you can tell where the composite ends and the pecton starts because there is always less on the on the pecton. Okay, that's what I was thinking. And you mentioned that's having the palatal exposed. I yeah. think a lot of um, people just assume you need to veneer. Any exposed pecton, visible pecton, with no. composite, and you don't. I mean that that's going to save. That's going to take a lot more time and material. And in reality, it could be better hygiene situation to have it exposed. That's another thing as well, from a time point of view, another reason why I absolutely love using pecton over over titanium is the simple the amount of time. Now we're going to cover this in a bit with how I get the crown shades right. Yes, I don't opaque the frames on either titanium or pecton on the on the preps. But when it comes to putting the pink on, on the titanium frame, even if I anodize it gold, I've still got to put some A2 or A1 composite opaque on. And that can take, you know, to do a few coats of that to get it right and take up to an hour. Whereas if it's pecton, I never put any colored opaque on. I just put the pink composite directly onto the pecton. So that saves me an hour each each case. So wow. So that, that's a, a massive boost. And people complain about the colour saying it looks like a funny colour, but they've not really worked with it. When you work with it, especially, I know this is Annex Gun, but you know I'm an Annex junkie when it comes to Annex Gun. Uh, and I've used all, all, all the composites out there, but I always come back to Annex Gun and all my life cases are always Annex Gun. Because of the optical properties of it, when you put it on Pecton, you don't need to use hardly any of it. And I'm going to quote again uh, John Whitley here because he was on the course that I did right at the beginning of the year with Sue McCallum in London. And he was amazed how thin the Annex gum was covering the pecton because he traditionally works with a different manufacturer's uh, composite. And he said he uses like three times more than that oh, wow. thickness to get to, to, to mask the colours out or to get the depth of colour. So again, it's just, you can keep more frame size. You're not having to reduce the frame as much, and you're having to use less materials to the composite. So yeah, an extent composite's expensive, but you don't use much of it. So yeah, you know, what are you it's doing? value. It's value, Phil. You're I giving me value. It saves me time because, as you know, as being a good friend of mine, you know how lazy I am. Anything I can do quickly that's not going to compromise the result, then and that's that's the way it's getting done. Yeah, yeah. I have Florian Steinheber, in, in who's actually going to be my next. Uh, guest on Annex School. But Florian called me. I sent him to a big lab to do some training. They wanted some private training. And he called me at a break. He said, Hey, they took, they said, give me some dark pink. And he's handed them a syringe of the Annex gum dark pink. And he said, they squirted it like they they extruded the whole thing onto their palate. He's like, I've never seen anything like that. That's it. I mean, uh, you, you literally, uh, you could do a course with 12 people on, you've got like two light pinks, one dark pink, one orange pink. That's going to do all 12. Yeah. And they're like, where's it? Where's is that? Your, where's that? No, that'll do it. No, no, wait, though. Wait, though. Everyone. That's good too. If you want to use a syringe for each quadrant oh that's fine i'm okay with that but you know it, it's true so let's talk really quick about how you control the final crown shade because i'm going to tell you when we were new to to thimble bridges in general because before pecton we didn't really talk about those i didn't understand a lot about the design challenges i, I learned a lot alongside our customers right. and um we i one particular technician um that I remember we just were scratching our heads. He would cement the crowns and then they just looked dead and mm -hmm. we couldn't figure it out. So we thought, we thought it was the pecton showing through. So we tried different opaquers. We tried mixing it into the cement. At the end of the day, we figured out it was just that the crowns were too thin on the facial surface. Yeah, yeah, sure. So no matter what we put under it, the minute they were cemented on the pecton, because it is opaque, um, 
they just look dead. The light well, couldn't pass well, through. Well, and then if you use just like a brighter cement, you cut it so thin, you're just going to see the bright outline of the prep in there. So there's, this is all to do with bar design. And again, it's something that we've worked a lot uh, optimizing in the lab. And it, I mean, Paul, who does all our um, bar designs here at the lab, he's so quick at doing it now it, and it, it's just simple things like when we w the thimble mode in echo it gives you perfect preps but it doesn't give you in the perfect position because right. those preps need to be lower the margins need to be lower to allow for your crown length to be lower so you can cut that uh 360 periphery on there to steal in with composite layer so everything needs dropping and everything needs tilting slightly back as well to give you a little bit more facial space. So when 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 Exo sort of put them in the right position and we've got them in sort of the right position, he just highlights them all, moves them all down, then highlights the front tips and tilts them all back slightly. And that do gives you them. have a case that you could show or a design that you could possibly show? If you if we need to pull it up later, that's fine. But do you have something where you could show the ideal crown design? Because I think. I spent a lot of time talking on the phone with technicians who were doing their first or second pecton case. And we talk a lot about preparing the crown for bonding with the composite. Yeah. And the first thing I say is, you know, I you, mentioned you this is that prior to cementation. Just the design of the crown itself. So having a longer neck, just yeah. giving yourself a visible kind of stop for okay. where you're going to etch. I've got exactly that now, share screen. One second. And, uh, and you can leave your screen share up, Phil. I'll just take it in and out of the feed so you don't have to keep okay. going back and sharing it. Right. Okay. So that, so, so that, can you see that now? Not yet. Oh, okay. Bear with me one second. Let's do screen share again. Right, let me just ask you to not ask me this question. Because I think it isn't totally clear with a lot of people that you do need to, you know, roughen and etch the, um, neck right. of the ground where you're going to bond composite and then it's hard to tell where you've etched and i mean it's complicated can you see that now yes so you can see that there's that extra length of the crown and this is something that's really that often happens when i'm doing like the course courses uh, the, the crowns uh, on the course model look really long and everyone goes these are really long and i'm and i say yeah but they have to be because you're going to lose a millimeter when you cut in that margin all the way around to then enclose that with composite, with a gum. Uh, and if you don't have that in there, if you don't have that, that, that lengthened crown, then what happens is you've got um, your uh, composite margin is going to be at the bottom of where your ceramic margin is. And that's no good. You need to bond the composite over the top of the ceramic all the way around. Yeah. yeah. So your, what's your minimal thickness, facial thickness um, for a crown? Oh, well, yeah, I, I, basically I want um, about 1.5 millimeters okay. in there. And do you know, the more that I do, the less I layer in I do, the more it's just an incisal, uh, a tiny incisal cut back and just a little bit of incisal layering. Um, I, you know, it's, it's tilting the, 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 the prep back ever so slightly. The more you tilt it back, the more space you get in that area where you're layering as well. And in all honesty, the, the easiest way to do it, and this is even on titanium, on chrome cobalt, on anything, once you've etched these crowns and they're ready to cement on, I just every single time I use this bright white hybrid abutment cement from... Um, I have a car. And so you're using that to cement your crowns too. But, yeah, but bearing, now if you're using a, a bleach shade, just use this on its own. So I think for a lot of people, it would just use this on its own. Obviously, I'm working in the UK. We got some, uh, some. Uh, let's just see. Shades on the go. So I still use this, but then I'd mix in. So you know your your basic standard um, opaque cement. So it's like annex opaque cement for uh, composite. I just take some of this and mix that in with it to so change, shift the value of the cement. So uh, you told me before how much because you, it's not much. You do like ten percent opaque so, to ninety percent so, cement. If I have an A3 crown that I want to get, and I've got white cement, I'd take an A3.5 or an A4 opaque cement and mix in like 15% just to shift the value from bright white to more like an A3 sort of core. That's okay. all, all I do, yeah. If it's a B1, I'd use the white and I'd mix in some B2, maybe 5% B2 opaque cement. I, I, I've been doing this now for five 
four years. And since I've been doing this, I haven't had one single debond. I've had 12 teeth debonding all the time I've been doing it. But since I've been doing this, I've not had one. I know that this works because I've had to grind some of these teeth off myself. Yeah, yeah. You, better move. you, you have to prep these teeth off. So I have no issues with mixing in a, a small amount of uh, coloured composite up here. Because if you're mixing just normal coloured composite, it's going to dilute the opacity of this cement. I want to keep the opacity to stop any shine through from the prep, but I don't want to then create shine through in the opposite way with right. the value. Okay. So okay. I, yeah, so it's a mixture. And again, you, you, you learn this very quickly with doing it. You can always do a test with one crown. Mix enough up for one crown, no, no, see what it looks like. If it doesn't look right, clean it out, try it again. But you usually, you get a lot of play. If you get it anywhere near the right value, it's not going to change the, the, the value of the crown at all. And okay. Do you do you ever just cement a molar first, completely cure the the cement, just to see what your final shade is, or do you now you probably are confident enough that you just go for it? I, I used to I used to do a long time ago, especially when we played for one point with with pink polymers. We were playing with those for a little bit at one point, and that was a nightmare shade shade managing. And then I'd, I'd, I'd be scared every time, but I don't. I just, I just don't even use that stuff anymore. Well, that's a good point because we get a lot of questions like, "When are you going to do a pink pecton?" And and why I, do you need it? Why, why would you need it? You know? I get it. I mean, I get it. It's pink, and the tissue is pink, and that's what shows. But it is ugly pink. Like it's not a beautiful yeah, pink. pink. You still got to then, you know, put composite on it anyway. So I, I just don't understand that. But again, I, I'm more of a fixed sort of guy so yeah i can see why the removable guys might want a pink version but yeah. I, not if you're doing this sort of stuff this hybrid i just find that she could it's yeah it's, it makes everything look really gray all the crowns look really gray i think so so we have a bunch of questions oh good so now if you haven't already commented with your questions please do that i'm really nervous because we haven't seen them and casey i can see casey's face right now and she's been <laughs> laughing sometimes so she asked me before this, like, if somebody posts like a ridiculous, inappropriate question, should you do you yeah. want that? Or I was like, yeah, yeah, I trust you. You know, not too inappropriate, but you know, it's an annex course, so whatever, anything goes. Only thing that's missing is the Jaeger bombs to start with. I know. I thought about that because it's it's time for you. Like, it would be appropriate for you. Yeah. Yes, definitely appropriate now. Yeah, sure. I needed I needed a Jaeger bomb like right before this started, but this is actually not so bad. I like it now. Yeah. Somebody offered me a gummy, and I was like, "Oh my god, no!" I'd be like, <laughs> and I'd I'd ask the wrong questions. <laughs> okay, so um, Casey, my Vanna White, will you put up a question for us from the comments? This is the first time we've done this, y'all. So let's see how it works. Okay, I'm going to add you to the stream. Okay. Hey, Casey. Hey, how's it going? Um, so I'm trying to figure this out because on ours, all, like on my screen, it looks like you can see all the live comments. No, I can see. I just see questions that you put up, that you post. That I just posted to y'all? Okay. Okay, yeah. fine. Did you did you like that one? Yeah. yeah. So I, I can guess the, the, which Josh that is as well. Correct. <laughs> And um, I've already had somebody saying, I need confirmation. And I said, if, if Josh is asking if Phil's wearing Gucci, I almost guarantee that it's, it is indeed Gucci. So, <laughs> Is it Gucci? Of course. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, he's, party. he's business on top today. Business and party. Gucci's business and party. Oh, no, no, no. It's definitely, definitely uh, Gucci, not, not Porsche. No. I'm not that sad. I wouldn't wear a Porsche like, hat and a <laughs> jacket and stuff. You know? <laughs> Okay. No, I know what one. I know what one I want to show. Okay, Casey, I'm kicking you out. Sorry. Girl. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. So I want to go back because you didn't really. I want to hear like Dan Elfring mistakes. Phil has made a mistake. You didn't necessarily tell me like. Okay. Okay. Mistake. You did yeah. show one broken frame. I want to hear like a real good mistake you made that you'll never do again. With pecton, right. not life in general. One good mistake. One mistake I'll never do again is um, when a patient's not sure what shade they want, then going, "Oh yeah, I think you like this one," and cementing a full twelve pound <laughs> on. Then the bridge back saying, "Actually, no, I want the what lighter one." Oh. 
because like I've said before, cutting you can't cut those things off. You have to prep them off. That when you bond those crowns on right, they don't come off off of pecton. You literally have to spend all day with your high speed grinding these things down. So that's a mistake. Now I'll send out tryings if there's any doubt of, of the final look of the crowns, or no matter how many times you do the the, the, the tryings of the dentures or the printed or mill PMMAs, there's usually something that the at some point with a certain patient where they're still not sure and you've got to say, right, okay, we're going to go for it. But if I've got one of those patients now, it's like, no, we're going to try these teeth on with some trials to men and some a little bit of pink gum around there just so they can get a full feel for it. Okay, trials to uh, men and a little bit of pink. Let's talk about trials to men. In and out, always, it's that whole thing of measure twice, cut one sort of thing, you know. I've, I've been Before I've been so confident that I would nail the aesthetics. I've gone, oh, no, it's fine. I'm going to do it, cement them on, send it out. And then, you know, the time, it, 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 it goes wrong. And that's happened twice to me now. So, yeah, that's a bad mistake. The other mistakes are talking people into going for things that they're not confident with because you can bet. Um, in fact, I know for a fact one of those failed arches was somebody who didn't want to go for pecton. And then he went for pecton and then had a frame fracture. Now, so I don't talk people in. Whatever they ask for, I give them these days, unless I think it's really going to compromise the situation. So if they, obviously if they ask for something and, and it's a no-brainer pecton, I would say maybe you could, you, are, you could consider this. But I wouldn't force them. That's another thing. I'd never force anyone to, 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 to choose something. Um, I don't put zirconia crowns on these things because I've done that and I've had issues. Okay, let's talk about that really quick because a lot of labs in the States that are trying to go full digital, no pressing, mm -hmm. they're putting zirconia crowns on. And I under, I think I know what problems you probably had, but talk to us a little bit about that. It's, the, uh, outs, it's, it's not so much the cementation because you can cement these things on. And in fact, they're easier to cut off. You can cut them off the dope bond uh, but it's the, it's the sticking of the composite around the margins. I always find that that just comes away very quickly uh, and you get staining around them. So I just, I, I, I'm, I'm just happy going to the pressed or the milled uh, lithium desilica each time. If I'm going to do layering anyway on the front ones, it's, you know, uh, the, the, the zirconia, I believe there's a zirconia etch on the market now, a new thing coming out. Yeah. Uh, how it works, but maybe that's going to change my mind again because the mill, the 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 mill, like we were using stuff like Hyperion from White Peaks and and Max, uh, their their Copper and Max and stuff like that from White Peaks. It's beautiful stuff. And when I'm doing a hybrid, a single crown I always goes in cornea because I'm not sticking any com good pink composite on the top of it. As soon as I have to put some pink composite on it, I want it, I want it to bond properly. So then I'm going back to lithium desilica, whether that be GC Lissy, Levento, Spra um, uh, the old Emac stuff, whatever. It all works. It's all great stuff. You know, it's whatever you're you're you're, you're best at working with, whatever works best for you. You know. Okay. So uh, if you had a zirconia arch, because I know there are a lot, or zirconia crowns on a pecton arch with composite, because there are a bunch out there. So let's say they come back and you've got staining leakage around the discoloration around the crowns. Yeah. Um, what do you do? Oh, I just, uh, as if I was trimming a die, trim all the, the margins around and re, uh, you know, try to block out all the ceramic that you don't want etching. I'd use the Aquacare system. I use the Coastal Lab, it's a medium, you know, the silica coating stuff and spray around each margin with that. Use a, a, a specific zirconia primer not one uh, bottle that does everything, one that's specifically for the zirconia, then I might like, redo the margins in, in the composite. So have you found, you, you mentioned to use a zirconia primer that's specifically for zirconia. So have you had issues when you've tried to use the multi-primers? Um, well, I say that, I think it is a multi-primer that I'm using. I, I've always just used the blue, <laughs> to be honest. It's the, I, use the, I use the blue and stuff, I use the K primer mm -hmm. and I use the MKZ primer. So yeah. that, that you, you know, so those I've never had any issues with, but there has been other products out there that um, people have tried and they've had lots of issues with the things. So, I, I, and I'll just go back to I've had abutments fracture and my zirconia crowns not come off abutments, so I know what I'm doing is, is working really well. They're, those cements are sticking and holding those things on, uh, and so that's what I'd apply to that's how I treat the outside of the zirconia as well. 
but it's far more um it's far more, more stages and it's far more technique sensitive than just etching something cleaning it and then sticking your composite straight on and knowing that that's going to bond really well you know yeah this stuff it's it's amazing i love the cornea but only for certain things and at the moment from a hybrids it's not even in the picture so let me ask you then um something else that i'm going to ask if you can bring up some pictures because i know you have them somewhere hopefully easy to find um when you are when you've cemented the crowns so I have to go through a lot of the steps so people and understand the chronological order, how things are done. So you're cementing the tie bases into the frame first, right? Yeah. You are cementing the crowns mm -hmm. and then you're doing the pink. Yeah. So once you've cemented the crowns, have mm -hmm. you etched, have you already etched the uh, margin for the composite when you've cemented? Do you etch the whole margin and the inside of the crown all at once? Or do you etch after cementation? I etch before cementation and then if uh, you know when i'm cementing on because i do all the crowns that went in one go all like 10 12 whatever there is of them i do them all in one go and i just make sure i really clean the buckle and interdental margins with a micro brush to get all the loose cement off but i know that any of the cement that does stick to the frame or to the to the margins it's already, it's going to be stuck to it properly so then i can just go straight over it with the paint or the stains or whatever i need to do and if i have to grind any of it off then i'll obviously re-etch and Reprime. Re Would you mind sharing? Um, I know you had some really cool slides that you'd put together for the course that we had planned. Would you mind sharing a couple of those images, just showing kind of the order that you do things to get that first layer of composite where you're bonding it to the crowns and kind of get your foundation down for the rest oh, of the paint? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, where are we? Where are we? We don't have to go into all the layering steps. I think at our in our next episode, mm -hmm. Florian's going to help me with that. But I I really like your steps that you take in the very beginning to get the color nice around the cervical of the crowns and to give yourself a good foundation. Okay, here we go then. So, I'll share it when you're ready. Ready, ready. Oh, well, I think I'm ready. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, um, once the crown the I cemented on. I use the and uh, the S color range from Annex just to give a little bit of life on the underneath it because especially if you've got um, a darker color, uh, then where you've etched, that's usually light. There's no stains on that or anything like that. So I'd like to then use some orange or some yellow just to give some warmth to that neck uh, before I put the um, uh, composite over the top of it. So it's basically just that, just some of those little colors, and then. I'll just go straight on to doing the, the composite layering with like orange pink and a little bit of the uh, light pink and dark pink just to seal everything in. Head straight forward, but it's mainly just the colors underneath that bring the thing to life. And one of the things I like about putting the colors on first is even the flowable composite, like the paste is pretty rigid, but the, the flow, yeah. of course, is flow. Um, Flow isn't the easiest to control exactly where it goes, but those colors right. that you're using are so thin. Exactly, I have to work with the with the with the paste, and I do only use three for most cases: the light, the the, the dark, and the orange. That's it. If if I'm not copying natural shades, pink, then if I'm just making it up as I go along, then that's all I need to use. And it gives you and that 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 little bit of color underneath, I think, is what makes the difference between the like the crown uh, and the and the gingiva that that connection that that way that it comes together. You know, I've seen Javier Vasquez does a similar thing, but he is using stain and glaze on the crown. So he's instead of applying oh. it as light cure, he's getting that same effect, and it it does. It makes such a big difference. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I think, you know, everybody's like so shy, guys. Come on. I know you're going to call me later and ask me questions, but I've got Phil <laughs> to answer your questions. Now, I know some of these. The thing is, Phil, we did a damn good job of like thinking of all their questions in advance. I think we covered a lot. Wow. Look at us. We've got a. Uh, some severe sun coming in now, setting down just behind, so just lower the, uh, the blind to get rid of the sun. Oh, you look beautiful now. <laughs> it's reflecting off my head. I've got a, a, a sweat on. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, it, look, it made you look so nervous. I'm glad to know you're just hot. 
<laughs> so I'm seeing a lot of people love the courtesy car bridge. I, didn't oh, yeah, yeah. That. I thought that was really smart no, because I, 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 I think if a clinician knows that you're going to um, have that option and then they're not so scared about what's going to happen to this bridge in the mouth. If we know that it's something that's easily fixed in the lab yeah. and that it's not going to take a great deal of time, it's not a, a full redo. It's a simple polishing up in the lab and refinishing then knowing that they're going to be able to take that bridge out of the mouth and still keep that patient happy and comfortable for that short period of time there without their bridge. I think that's huge. So. Yeah, and do you know what? And you know, a lot of these bridges, especially in the UK, they're done on a conversion. So there's teeth taken out and there's a, an immediate bridge made. Uh, so a lot of the patients have actually already got those courtesy bridges. Let's say, you know, some of those are not looking so hot after maybe 12 months in, in, in transitional phase. So that's when you would then, once you've got the the bridge in and every, and the patient's really happy, you've got this full design already. You've 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 sent out the the uh, the try in already almost. You know the the printed version that you've sent out for to double check things. You've already got that. Some people can just con you can just either convert that to put some cylinders in it, or you can just use that um, that same design and and you know and redesign one in, and mill it out in uh, multicolored PMMA. It's if you've already got it, you don't have to do any redesigning or any yeah. reworking. You just switch the mill on, do a bit of hand finishing, and glue some cylinders in, and there's your there's your courtesy car. Your courtesy so is, the, is in the cases that you know where you're handling it that way. Is the is the patient keeping that courtesy bridge in their possession and bringing it with them to the appointment? I mean, I guess you could do it a lot of different ways, but what works? Um, again, you know, it's um it's different for it's different for every patient and every dental surgery i think most of the surgeries like to keep a patient box that's got their original guides in it it's got the nozzles that they've used for the interoral scans it's all in there in individual single use box and i think that's where the courtesy bridges are, are, are sitting and staying you know generally and then if the patient's got a problem they've got it you give it to a patient and they come back in and say right you got your bridge oh we've moved house and <laughs> I was showing my, my daughter and the dog at it or whatever, so yeah, it's probably best to keep it all in surgery. I don't want to have a stack of stuff here at the lab as well, and it's best being at the surgery, so when the dentist gets the call on a Friday night at 10 p.m. saying, Doc, uh, you know, I've got a, an issue, can I come in and see you? They, they don't have to think, right, I need to call the lab now and get the bridge shipped. It's, you know, it's yeah. just more sense to have it there at surgery. So I'm going to say right now, I knew, I knew Dan Elfring would ask good questions. I counted on him. Oh, I'm sure he knew about this because I knew he'd have good questions. This is a good question. So if you were doing a single unit, would you mill and bond two versus directly pressing to a cylinder and eliminate the bonding, bonding protocol? I see a lot of advantages to pressing to the cylinder. I see a lot of people doing that. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? In all honesty, I don't really do that. I tend to just do titanium and put a, a zirconia unit on it. I don't you do single pecton stuff, to be honest. Uh, but if I was doing it, I think Bill Murray does a, does loads of these types of things. And Dan yeah. really the point, pressing to the cylinder would be better when you've got no real anti-rotation forces like you get with the bridge, you know? Again, this is another reason why I don't really do the singles is I've gone straight down now. Everything is milled. Or printed, and if I if I have to need to then start doing the burnout process and pressing again, and it's like I, I don't want to be doing that. I've done it a few, enough times to know I don't want to do it any longer. I just want to mill, and uh, that's another reason why I've just switched. I think we don't we we've got good options already, um, and I, I don't see any point in me personally complicating it. But if I was to do a single, I would do what Dan suggests, and I'd press to it. Okay. After that reason. But, yeah. Another good question from my buddy, Dan. So on the pumice, fine pumice, not medium, or do you go medium and then fine? Now you talked about using the lathe, but what do you do? Yeah, just uh, ju just the fine pumice that we're using that on for, for polishing uh, acrylic, yeah. Okay, so oh. I'm looking at your questions, guys. What else? Florian, I knew you'd ask a good one too. You bond pecton already for the composite before you fix the crowns. The crowns are already etched in the cervical. Ah, yes. So I get this question a lot too. 
You wow. and I would love actually to show some images of the surface of the pecton after you've abraded it with the AquaCare because I, I think I got some of those. I can show you those. Let's do that and then let's talk about your bonding steps. If you've got some images, I think it'll help. Yeah, I've got the images. Where are we? Let's just find find them. Because I have to say, I mean, I know it's my job to sell the aqua cares, so take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> but right, I okay. we're doing a lot of on, this, they all have the aqua care, and I know it just seems like you could sandblast aqua care. For those who don't know, it incorporates liquid in the blast stream. So you're constantly cooling and cleaning the surface. In, in our case, we're, you know, in the lab case, you're filling it with high, high percentage isopropyl alcohol. So that became um, a really popular tool for people to use if you're doing much pecton. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to show your screen, Phil. So this is AquaCare. If, uh, this is an old slide. I've done, I've done some new ones where it shows you half and half, actually. Yes. Let's find those because that's, that's much more effective. That would be, um, uh, um, oh no, I'll stick to this because it can take me a while to find it, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, but you can see here, I've missed, I've actually missed the spot in the proof as well. You can see it's still shiny. So that's pecked on out of the mill, how shiny it is. And then this is after AquaCare. You can see the surface it gives you. It's a really good surface to then to, to, to bond to. So are you then, I mean, one thing I noticed, so Marco from Sonder Mateau, he was <laughs> kind of always giving me hell about the AquaCare because, yeah. I mean, Marco's worked with Pecton for years. Long, as long as anybody. As long as anybody. Yeah, as long as I love that picture of you talking with Marco and it was like the moment you guys met and said, and you said what you wanted to do with it and he said, it's a great idea. So yeah. Marco's been around Pecton a while. And when we had the Pecton uh, or the Full Arch Summit at, Chicago this year, yeah. I finally made him use it. And yeah. when he used it, he was like, oh, he yeah. said, well, put the bonder on. So one of the tricky things, and I swear, this is probably the most common problem people have mm -hmm. is they put the bonder on, they put too much mm -hmm. bonder, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looks wet and it is, and it's not cured and it just dissolves whatever you put on it because there's all that monomer. Mm -hmm. So, um, he saw a huge difference when he would go to put the bonder on it, just soaked in. So right. you've got this whole frame, you're bonding the tie bases in. With each step, are you waiting to apply the pec bond or the Visio link? Are you waiting to apply that pecton primer until you're ready to put the material on or are you just doing the whole thing? So when I'm doing this, the first thing I'll do is the cylinder. So I'm gonna do all the procedures with that. I'm gonna aqua care, I'm gonna let, you know, let everything dry off, then I'm gonna apply the bonder, I'm gonna cure that, and then I'm gonna cement the cylinders in. Then I'm gonna do the other work. I've got other work to do. I've got crowns to make and stuff like that before I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm you know, I've got the e Emacs to fit down or the Levento to fit down or whatever I've got to fit down. I've got all that to do before I'm thinking about cementing the teeth on. So then I, I wouldn't, aqua care the entire frame until just before i'm ready and i would do generally way beyond the preps when i'm cementing the preps on because i don't want to then have to go back with the aqua care and, and risk sandblasting the the, pol the polished or glazed surface of the crowns so yeah I, I do i do it all then if there's any if I, if there's any areas i'm not sure about then i would you know isolate those areas and go back with the aqua care again and apply the bonding uh, It'll, uh, the but, can, can you pull the picture back up that you had of that first step after you've submitted the crowns and you're putting the colors on? If you'll pull that up, yeah, I want to yeah. ask a question about that. Okay. That, that one. Yes. So let's say that you've just submitted the crowns, which means that mm -hmm. surface was etched on the crown but not primed, right? Or are you priming with the K primer? Oh, no, so I would prime that surface. I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor moving. Yeah. I would prime that surface, uh, absolutely, yeah. So that- For cementation, for cementation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Then if any cement goes on it, I'm not worried it's, you know, it's it, sure. it will be bonded to it properly. I can clean it off anyway, but it, if I miss a bit, I I know I'm not having to grind it off. It's it's stuck there. Okay, it's you know it's it's not a problem. So okay, I, so you've cemented the crowns. Yeah. That surface is already etched and primed for the composite. Uh huh. 
your pecton surface is already sandblasted and cleaned with the aqua care. So at that point, that's when you apply the layer of the Visio Link or the Peck Bond. Yeah, and you can see just at the bottom here there where the Visio Link or Peck Bond hasn't gone, it's still sandblasted under there. Can you see? Oh, got it. So that's why this is now changed color again because I've primed it. Got it. So then you're yeah. curing that and then you're good to go. So that's kind of the, the steps, I would say. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, there's some questions. I knew Ben Mueller would ask good questions too. So he asked, do you still glaze with Dreva Nano Varnish or with OptiGlaze? OptiGlaze, I use the OptiGlaze and I've switched to the OptiGlaze Luster Paste for composite. I just find that I really like it. I mean, I can't tell you whether the long-term results are gonna be the same because I've only been using it for a year and a half. Um, but so far, I just I just love the, the OptiGlaze from GC, the, the luster paste optiglaze stuff, the new optiglaze. Oh, I didn't know they had a new one. So a lot of people that we sell the nano varnish from Dreva, mm -hmm. and a lot of people have liked the viscosity of it better than the optiglaze, like the classic optiglaze, not the LV. So is the optiglaze luster paste version? I like the luster paste or L because you've got some liquid and you've got some paste, and you make your own viscosity with it. Okay. You make what works for you, you know. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good question. Thanks. I, the reason that I like it is because I think it's it doesn't smell as crazy as the as the drave stuff. It does I, smell. <laughs> I think I think it's it, it, you know you it, it feels a little bit more. Um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I control it a little bit better personally. Yeah. It's control over the. The, the mix, the ratios, and how it how it feels and how it works. But you hadn't seen any issues specifically with Dreva. There wasn't a reason you switched from the performance of it. It was more just a handling issue. Basically, somebody dropped off the luster paste kit here and said, "Try this." I tried it and I loved it and stopped uh, and stopped ordering the Dreva. I had no issues with the Dreva at all. Nothing. But GC, they're just always dropping off kits with people. GC. <laughs> you? Yeah, one I, day, one I, day. I, I paid Gonna show up and drop off kits, okay? Yeah. We're trying. <laughs> but then I, I, you know, I did buy the kit. I don't, I don't get free stuff these days. Hey, I like that. I like yeah. that about you. Okay, <laughs> so here's one that I have seen a number of times throughout uh, the comments. Are you still pressing? And we've touched on it a little bit. You're not just period anymore. No, no. Even to the point that it's made me reduce the amount of cases that could be packed on. Um, we used to press over metal a lot, and I saw that Bill did a uh, Maryland the other day pressing over packed on over metal. We used to do that a lot when we had not enough vertical space. For me, I am not that. So I I don't I don't I don't get involved with any of the pressings of any of the materials. I don't get involved with anything other than I go and check some of the designs and I do the ceramic at the end now. So whenever, obviously, when Lee worked for me, um, he was doing all that stuff, and that's what he was doing most day in day out pressing things. Whenever he took a holiday, it'd take me a full day to press one arch. I'd be like, man, this is a, such a pain. And as soon as Exacad got to the point where the thimble design worked and I could manipulate it as much as we wanted, as quickly as we can, it became an absolute no-brainer for me to stop doing any pressing. Even when Lee was here, we was uh, to, uh, towards the end, we were switching more and more stuff to the digital because it just made no sense. Uh, pressing anymore it was taking yeah. way too much time uh the, the, the only reason that I would uh, is for things like what bill did recently and for if you're pressing to a single unit or if you definitely wanted to use pecton on a full arch because of whatever reason you know you uh, then you could press over a metal frame that's the only reason but now if i did want to do that i don't mill a titanium frame you know like you see for the zirconia arches where they've got a primary uh, titanium and a, a sleeve of zirconia that fits over the top. Yeah. Do more of a design like that if I, if I was desperate to to use uh, pecton over anything else. That's what I do now rather than press. So no. Just to make it on instead of pressing it. Yeah, not press pecton for three years now, I don't think. Wow. Okay. So um, there is a question that I haven't gotten as much recently, but I'm surprised. And I'll tell this um, viewer 
that he had asked also about what's your opinion on metal composite bridge for implants. So that is talked about a little bit um, earlier in the stream and you can watch the archive, but is there any possibility of printing Pecton? You and I both have kind of kept up to speed on, on what's possible, but the problem with any printed materials um, other than metal at this point um, is the properties. The technical properties of it are not the same. It's not as dense. So right now for dental, the answer is no. Do you, uh, are you aware of any other printable polymers? Uh, one of the dentists that I work with, um, he's got a printer that prints polymers and he's been playing around with it for doing temporary restorations. But we had a long discussion about it and we were both in the, uh, under the very strong opinion that it would be no good for, 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 our, for our arches because of the, like, exactly as you say, it's the, the filament size and the density. And just even if you got uh, to the point where the geometries could be printed correctly, because that's another big thing as well for my, you know for the, the fine designs of say a, a, a prep or whatever. Sometimes those prints struggle with that type of thing, but they're getting better all the time. The, the, the problem would be that I think we would get too, too many fractures. I think we get yeah. prep snapping off. And this is one of the things I've only ever had one lower to prep snap off of the pecs on our, our arch. Those preps uh, are strong. You know they, they're good. And this is another reason why I like milling it because of the way that it's made. And when I say think about other materials that are milled, that are produced in different ways with different types of reinforcement, once you start cutting into those, it makes problems. So that is why for my full arch bridges, if it's a hybrid, it's titanium or pecton. They're the only two that I offer, the only two that I do. If it's a, a I do acrylic wraps, but that's not a hybrid. For a, a hybrid with preps on, it's titanium or pecton, nothing else. Uh, and printed, yeah, not at the moment, even though we print, tons of stuff here we've got four different printers now five printers in total it's it's, it's, it's not there yet it's no. not there yet okay we talked a little bit about this but i love yon and i'm so happy he came today he's so cool so i'll ask again because i think we had a lot of people join probably right after we talked about it do you have problems with plaque on pecton definitely no more than we do with any other type of uh, material that's not say ceramic so a glazed ceramic has the least amount over everything but when it comes to highly polished pecton when you can see where the composite ends and where the pecton starts when you've got somebody that's got really bad hygiene and they've collected a lot of uh, film and plaque and stuff under uh, but it's, so it is easy to take off and it generally is more down to the patient's hygiene and the design of the bridge that causes the problems rather than the material itself the material itself it, when it's polished correctly and designed rightly as, is as good as pretty much anything I'd say other than polished uh, zirconia or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we might be at the end of the questions. Let me check. Um, oh, Vaughn has a great question. <laughs> 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 is normal is in the eye of the beholder, Vaughn. He's quite normal size. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a special camera that I use for my adult movies. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Well, um, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. I know, it's been my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, this was fun. You didn't get the inappropriate questions I was expecting. I was expecting a lot of inappropriate questions, to be honest. But uh, yeah, good, good of Bond to come in at the end there with at least one. Yeah. 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 But yeah. I think, um, yeah, I I think that's it. I yeah. think that's well, it. it. So well, and as I, you know, and make an apology to my wife at the moment, Jessica. I do answer most questions that I am sent on Facebook and it does drive her insane that I answer them at all sorts of different times when I should really be listening to what she's saying. But yeah, I, you know, anyone who's ever been on one of mine or Lee's courses or has any questions, get in touch with me, myself and anything that I will always be honest. There's no sales bullshit. It's just what I use and what works. And uh, yeah, and that's it yeah thank you for anyone who's tuned in and yeah i hope it was worthwhile for everybody and thanks to you Tay, for uh sorting this out and uh yeah taking the time with me for the first one <laughs> oh, this was fun well and i know um you're always really helpful with me i i we really try to convince people hey 
I know with a lot of companies, the person they're ordering from usually really doesn't know a whole lot about the product. We really have tried to learn the most we can from you. And um, you have been so awesome when people do ask us questions. If we don't know the answer, you've been great support for us too. And I think a lot of people probably even watching this broadcast have experienced when you've helped us. So thank you for always being helpful and yeah. sharing your knowledge. One of the benefits of being a, a, a you know, a, a, of never sleeping basically <laughs> i know i usually were messaging sometimes i'm th looking at the clock and doing the conversion and thinking oh my god it's 2 a.m and he's answering questions <laughs> sorry for sending you questions at 2 a.m i kind of think you're not going to okay. sleep think you're sleeping but no, you always answer <laughs> so, thank you so much and guys we're going to make i'm going to make a little test after i watch the recording i make a little test that proves you were here and you watched it and if you're a cdt and you want a credit you can fill out that test after we um, post a link on our page and send it in and I'll send it in for you. So you get, awesome. I'm going to say an hour and a half scientific credit. Uh, yeah, it's an hour and 15, so let's bump it I up. know. Uh, yeah, sure. Awesome. So thank you everybody for coming to Annex School. Florian Steinheber, all the way from Stuttgart, Germany, is going to talk to us about pink composite next time in a couple of weeks. Excellent. Thank you, thank you Phil. Yeah, thanks to everyone who's tuned in, seeing a lot of friendly uh, names on there. So, yeah. Yeah, guys, and uh, yeah, until next time, enjoy. Next time. Bye. 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 Everyone. Bye. 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 Cool.